Good morning. Well, welcome to chapel. Are you excited to be here? I'm excited. Uh, I'm going to start requiring people to sit in at least the first four rows. So prepare that. I'll, I'm going to change your hearts one day. But I'm glad you're here. We're excited to worship together and spend some time together. I have a couple of announcements I want to make you aware of. One of those you've heard several times. Are there any seniors here? Are there any seniors left in the building? All right. Good. Got a couple of seniors. Love you guys. Something we are doing, a tradition we started last year, is to provide a senior service. This is basically an opportunity for us to send you off, to commission you off. And I just want to remind you, it's April 28th at 4 p.m. in the chapel. If you're not a senior, raise your hand. Look at there. You are also invited to this because we are a family here at Campbellsville, and we want to support our seniors. We want to pray for them. We want to walk with them. And I invite you to that service as well. Maybe you know some seniors that are graduating. This is a great opportunity to show them support, encouragement, and that you care. And if you are faculty and staff, raise your hand. You are also invited. And I know as a staff and a person who gets to teach occasionally, uh, this is where our heart is in these students, that we get to pour into them. And God has given this amazing just blessing for us to walk with you guys and we really do remember you and care about you, and we want you to know that we do not forget about you when you leave, that it's, uh, it's a lifelong journey, that we're here to support you and love you and uh, send you out as God leads. And so April 28th, 4 p.m., Ransdale Chapel, Senior Service. Something amazing is happening at the end of this week that we also want to invite you to, and that is the official kickoff celebration launch of the Center for Faith and Ministry, April 12th on this Friday, and so there's a couple of things I want to make you aware of. At 9 a.m., it's going to be a service of dedication here in the chapel. What time? Nine. And then at 11 is the ribbon cutting, and that will happen at the log cabin at the Center for Faith and Ministry. There's going to be a groundbreaking for a new prayer garden uh, that honors uh, Dr. James Jones. I have a real big heart for Jones. He was my pastor for a long time. Uh, he performed the wedding for my sister. Just an amazing man, and it's going to be an amazing spot where you can be able to be in the presence of the Lord and pray. Uh, but at that place, you'll also have opportunity to get some free food. There's going to be a reception. How many of you love food? Amen. And how many of you love chapel credit? Yes, yes. And so at this uh, ribbon cutting, you can also receive chapel credit. And uh, I hope that you make time to go over there because this is going to be something that God is going to use in a powerful way uh, on this campus and already is doing so. And so uh, Center for Faith and Ministry kickoff ribbon cutting April 12th, this Friday, 9 a.m., It'll be here, and then at 11, it'll be at the cabin. And so if you have any questions, let me know about that. Um, or Dr. Hernandez, I saw her around here as well in the back. If you have questions, she can help uh, push you in the right direction for that as well. So excited to worship with you this morning. Uh, one of my favorite people on campus is going to open us in prayer this morning. If you guys would help me welcome Alan. Come on up, Alan. <laughs> Wait a minute, Alan. Hold on. I got some beef with you real quick. So Alan works at McDonald's, and I was in the drive-thru yesterday. And I asked for an apple pie. And they were like, yeah, we got apple pie. So when I got to the window, I see Alan's face. And what did you give me, Alan? Strawberry and cream pie. Strawberry cream pie. Not quite an apple pie, but we're going to ask that the Lord will forgive you for that mistake uh, today. But Alan, would you open us this morning in prayer? <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for how good you are. We present ourselves to you this morning with thanksgiving, and I pray, Lord, that during our worship time, you reveal yourself to us. And I pray, I pray that through the preaching of your word, we might know you even more. And Father, whatever the situation it is in our lives this morning, I pray that you let us rest in your peace, your abundant peace. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand with us, let's worship this morning.
Father God, we thank you for this morning, Lord. I pray uh, over Brother Dan as he comes to share with us this morning. We're so excited to have him here, Lord. Just fill this place with your spirit and, and let it overflow to all of us and just touch our hearts today, God. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord is here. It's like smoke in the building. Uh, can you see it? But uh, welcome, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers. Uh, I, it is my responsibility, my pleasure, and certainly my joy to uh, introduce to you our speaker for this morning. And uh, stage assistant, Jamie Lawrence, give it up for Jamie. Right there, right there. And let me just, uh, a word. Dr. Hernandez would want me to say, uh, remember about this Friday, 9 a.m., to hear a speaker like Robert Smith preach. Uh, you can tell your grandchildren you heard Robert Smith preach and, uh, and for the inauguration of Center for Faith and Ministry. But this morning, it is my joy to uh, introduce to you uh, a wild man. His name, uh, Germanic in origin, means wild and uh, so you uh, get ready uh, for Dan Wilt. And um, uh, I, I and other faculty and uh, students in the School of Theology have been reading uh, uh, one of Dan's books called Jesus in the Wild, which is a, a, a devotion piece on Jesus in the wilderness. And, and I love this page the, where he writes, uh, the Bishop Irenaeus of Lyon, said it um, well. He said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. If we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to have to trust who he and the Father and the Spirit have said we are. Beloved, chosen, royal, priest, living sacrifice, child of God. And then we're going to have to risk something to actually trust knowing it could cost us our lives. Let's live fully alive in the presence of God. Well, Dan Wilt, after God made him fully alive, uh, when he, as a younger man, uh, over 30 years ago, uh, first trusted in Christ, God gave him gifts 
to encourage the body of Christ, to encourage others through worship. And then eventually God would just allow him to become a worship pastor to worship pastors. And uh, all the while developing his ability to help us to follow Jesus closer. Uh, He's the author of Sheltering Mercy uh, and Endless Grace, two books that uh, are prayers based on the Psalms. And then, of course, Jesus in the Wild, um, A Well-Worn Path, Receive the Holy Spirit, Root, and other books. Uh, But what you will find this morning is uh, a man fully alive to God and one who wants you to experience that life uh, so that you can be living the glory of God as a human being fully alive to him. Would you help me welcome Dan Wilt. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it really is a privilege to be with you today. Uh, it's been a gift to be sharing in some of the classes of the School of Theology. Thank you, Dr. Hurchin, for inviting me uh, to what has been a year of spiritual formation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Wigginton and Dr. Garrison for inviting me into their classes and you for attending chapel this morning and making it one of those that you have chosen to go to in your card. Um, it really is a privilege to be here. I've had a long-standing uh, affection for this university, for uh, people in this community. This town reminds me of my hometown, Middletown, Pennsylvania. Could there be a more generic name for a small town? And they named it that very, you know, cleverness and ingenuity isn't, you know, isolated to our time. People sat around, I imagine, a boardroom table and decided, well, we're between York and we're between another city. Well, let's name it Middle Town. And they all looked at one another and said, that's a great idea. And I'm always fascinated by that person who said, that's a great idea. So, Middletown, Pennsylvania, I come from a small town. And um, this morning, uh, I really come to you with, with my heart full of the topic that I've been invited to share about. And it's a topic that my guess is uh, many of you have heard many different messages about. And all I would ask is that as I share on this topic and you go back to everything you've ever thought or felt about it before, that you would be so kind as to just put it up and to the right. I don't want you to lose track of it, but we also don't want it to get in the way of the fresh revelation that God might give us related to the particular topic. And my task in in my own heart is to convince you that there is an ancient spiritual practice that we might consider, especially in its roots, the most ancient spiritual practice in its inception in the heart of God that we have in the scriptures. And I want to convince you that Uh, uh, of something that I deeply believe to the core uh, of my own being, and that is that it is important enough that your life actually depends on it. And by that, I mean our physical lives depend on it, but I also mean that life that we are intended uh, by Jesus to have more abundantly I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. The quality of our lives depends on it. Our psychological life, our emotional life, our physical life. And I'm going to just drag it out a little bit longer as to what it is. Many of you already know, especially the Old Testament professors here already know where I'm going. But I want to just say something about where this spiritual practice finds its roots, finds its genesis. It's literally in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 2, verse 3, something is called holy. It's the first time that anything is called holy in the scriptures. And it's not a person. It's not a thing. 
It's not a building, it's not a land. It's a realm, an idea that we call time. The first thing to be called holy is time. Let me read the verse to you. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, kadosh, set apart, precious, treasured, vital, essential. He calls it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Abraham Joshua Heschel in his book, Sabbath, if you haven't read it, it worth a long lingering in its pages, a savoring of it. We tend to gulp things that God intends us to sip and savor in the scriptures. I think that applies to many areas of our reading life. But he says that time is the only realm that it seems we have utterly no control over. You see, we have control of the physical world. We have control of physical things. We create things. We build things. We make things. We're makers in this world. But when it comes to time, it slips through our fingers, doesn't it? We try to stop time. We try to speed up time. We try to use time wisely. We, uh, we waste time. We do all sorts of things with time because the current, the river of time, keeps going, and we're just doing our best to manage it. And God knew that right from the beginning. And that's why he said, I'm going to actually take time Call it holy, a space within the realm of living that is out of the control of people, and I'm going to make it my own. In fact, he will say over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament, the Sabbath, the Shabbat, the ceasing of time belongs to me, not you. And in this moment, we recognize the principle or what I'm going to call this morning, the way of Sabbath is a gift of God to human beings, not to own, but to be transformed by. I'd like to talk to you about this way, this way of Sabbath living, this way of Sabbath moving through this life that is infused with three gifts from God. The first one is rest, the second is renewal, and the third one, wait for it, it's actually my favorite and I haven't heard anyone else use this term for it, so I'm very excited to share it with you. Revelry, revelry. The Sabbath is one of the feasts of the Jewish people. The only difference is the Sabbath as a 24-hour period, I'm going to be talking about the principle, but also the 24-hour period, the Sabbath was given as a gift for people to settle into the goodness of life as God made it. So we have in Genesis 2 verse 3 this moment where we see that God rested. The word here, of course, is Shabbat. It literally means to stop, to cease. But it means more than that. It means to settle in and revel in all that has just been done. It is a point of satisfaction. It's a point of delight. How many of you would would like more joy in your life? I mean, really, would like to experience life in all of its fullness, to get all you can out of each day, to notice all the gifts of God, to enjoy the taste of good food. Mm. Do I hear an amen or shake that bush or something from the congregation? The taste of good drink, the laughter of friends, connection, healthy, sweet connection with family members, children, uh, relationships, to savor the worship of God, to recenter and reorient ourselves. That word Shabbat literally is connected in the Hebrew mind to shalom. It's the peace of God, the the permeating, all-pervading peace. And so God comes to his people and he gives us the gift of Sabbath. Now, when I grew up, I had never even heard of Sabbath. Now, some of you, that might be odd for your upbringing. I never heard the word Sabbath. I never heard it talked about. I didn't understand 
uh, Sabbath as being a Sunday or Sunday as being a Sabbath. Uh, we went to church with some level of frequency, but it was a nominal Christian home. I didn't come to faith until really I was in high school, and then that faith began to flourish in my university years. And in my university years, it was the first time I ever heard someone teach on the topic of Sabbath. And I remember sitting there listening to this teaching, and uh, I was listening to it with an open heart and an open mind, and as the, the, the pastor was sharing about the topic of Sabbath, honestly, I sat there shaking my head thinking, this is the best idea ever. He's talking about a 24-hour period every seven days where my entire job is to slow down to stop the work, to power down my phone, to enjoy good food, to enjoy friendships, to enjoy family, to walk slowly through beauty, fields, forests, wherever, to wander aimlessly, which is a particular favorite thing of mine to do on a Sabbath. I like to wander aimlessly through fields. I know to passers-by it looks very strange, but it's my jam. I love to spend Sabbath that way to enjoy the sound of great music, to reorient and give thanks for the days that have gone before, to see what God was doing, and then to turn toward the week ahead with hope bubbling in my heart, trusting that God will show himself to me, that he'll show others himself through me. As it was described, it was, it was described with the language of delight, of presence to my life, of awareness of what was happening without the blur catching me off guard, not only for days, but for weeks and months on end. For over 30 centuries, a particular people group every week has been stopping, ceasing for a period of 24 hours. And we come to our time and and honestly, and I, I don't say it with any weight or burden, but we tend to think, well, it's kind of optional for us. I don't know. We have email. They didn't really have that. We have phones. They didn't really have that. You know, and, and, and yet through the years, I began to experience people who would come to me whenever I'd talk about Shabbat and I'd feel like a little kid talking about what a gift this is, what a treasure. And they'd say, honestly, Dan, I have a really negative response when I hear the word Sabbath. Because where I grew up, it was held legalistically. What Sabbath meant was church. And I was like, which is good, right? And they said, yeah, until it's church and more church and more church and more church. And they had no concept of this sweetness, this delight that was placed, invested in this sense of time, this Sabbath principle right from the beginning of time that God would delight in all he had made and then he would stop and cease to revel in it, in that spirit of satisfaction and orientation to all that had just happened. So I began to meet those people and I, I felt compassion for them. But I began to resolve and, and try to help them resolve that just because something is misunderstood, misused or misconstrued, doesn't mean we throw it away. In fact, it means that it's probably a very good thing that has been distorted. We should actually give more attention to those things that are damaged to get to the essence of the gift that they're intended to be. Sabbath, a 24-hour period of ceasing, a 24-hour period of resting, of renewal, of reveling in all that God is doing and is about to do becomes for us a day that creates a way in which we live. A way that is in contradistinction to a world that quite literally is in a hurry. But I've actually stepped back from that and thought, no, I don't think we're in a hurry. I think the hurry's in us. 
that we are trying to get a hold of time and master it and hold it while God is saying, I own this, you don't own this. As Heschel says, we are living in eternity and time. We have that seventh day, no morning or evening. We are living in this eternity and God says, I want to set aside, it's mine, 24 hours in which you revel in all that I'm doing, and you rest this body, but you also rest this mind, you rest this heart, you rest this spirit, you do whatever it takes to renew you as you see what I've been doing, noticing it, and then you perceive and expect me to do even more of the same. A life built that way with that steady rhythm is transformed over days and weeks and months and years until we become people of the Sabbath way. Matthew Sleeth in his excellent book, 24-6, I encourage you all to get it, is a respected doctor and he has researched Sabbath and Sabbath principles. And if any of you have ever seen the Netflix series, uh, Live to 100, Secrets of the Blue Zones, uh, it's a great documentary to watch, you can, you'll learn a lot. But one of the studies they do is they actually study Seventh-day Adventists in California, one of the only groups that actually holds to this. And they, they begin to examine their lives and they begin to do studies. And Matthew Sleeth records this idea that, that they begin to find that these people are on average living about 11 years longer than everyone else. Well, for those who like math, you start to do the math and, and he came up with the, the sense that that's approximately all the Sundays that make up a life. 24 hour periods of resting, ceasing, renewing, moving in delight in all the good gifts of creation. And that brings us back to this idea that, and I'm gonna say this, this boldly, but you'll have to let me finish the sentence because the first part might sound like heresy, but when I finish the sentence, you'll see that it's actually not. God is not inviting you to keep Sabbath. God is inviting you and I to be kept by Sabbath. God is inviting you and I to be kept by Sabbath. Someone said to my wife the other day, well, he's a, he's a well-kept man, Anita. And she was saying, he, the, the person was saying that to her because they were saying, well done. He needs help, and you, you're a great keeper of his heart, you know. And, and the person was right. <laughs> but that image is a picture of we are a cared-for people. We don't move through this world, you know, with some uh, you know, deistic God who steps back and watches us do it. God leans in and he says, I'm going to create rhythms. I'm going to create mechanisms. I'm going to give you a regulatory system, and I'm going to call it Sabbath. A regulator in, in electricity, in voltage, what does a regulator do? It says there's power here. There's a lot of agency going on with electricity. It could do a lot of things. But what does a regulator do in electricity? It controls. And if we don't like that word, because that brings up some legalistic things, let's say it firmly guides the system. So the system doesn't overuse its power and blow up. So the system doesn't underuse its power and fall into apathy and a general sense of, of wandering through this life aimlessly. A regulator helps us manage something that's out of our control left to itself. And left to itself, our usage of time, how many of you have found that you are masters of time? That when you go to your Instagram and you start to stroll, that's okay. I gave myself 7.2 minutes to scroll. And now I'm going to stop at 7.2 minutes. Done. On to class. How many of you have found that as soon as you start, you're in a vortex? You're in the black hole. I watched Interstellar last night again, simply because I had to with my good friend. And you're in that black hole and the pool is strong with this one. With that iPhone, the pool is strong with this one. The force is strong with it. And it sucks us in, and we waste time. But somehow we rationalize it that that was actually helpful. But what we actually did was we didn't waste time. We invested time. And when we invest time, 
we realize that we get benefits, return on investment, right? And so we begin to see that time, biblically, is not something that's scarce, We can have a scarcity mentality. Listen to our words. I don't have enough time. I wish I had more time. This paper is due. I need more time. Please may I have more time? I need more time to get this accomplished. There's just not enough time in a day. How many of you have used that kind of language? Time is not scarce. In the heart of God, time is lavishly and abundantly present. It is over the top enough. You and I have enough time but we can become disoriented as to how to invest it, how to use it, how to steward it, how to curate it. And so God steps in and he goes, I'm gonna give you a principle and I'm gonna have it come up every seven days. And we have to figure out what that 24 hour period looks like for us. But my wife and I follow, again, thousands of years of Jewish tradition in this. We actually, in order to mark it, we light a candle at sundown. For us, our Sabbath would go uh, sundown Saturday to sundown Sunday night because time was marked a day as a sundown to sundown rather than a morning to a, to a night. And so we actually light a candle and we pray a very simple prayer because we found that Dan got excited about it one day and decided he was gonna create a whole liturgy around this moment in time as we light the candle. My wife was like, first of all, you forget to do it sometimes. And second of all, it's just too long. I go, yes, you're right. So we stop. We light our Christ candle. We've got a nice white pillar. And we just light it, and we pray a prayer. We commit ourselves to the Sabbath. We commit ourselves to rest, renewal, and revelry, to delight. And then we walk away, and the candle keeps burning while we're doing the dishes. And I'll look over while I'm doing the dishes, and I'll realize, oh, my goodness, we are late for church. I need to, and I'll glance at the candle. All right, slow down, slow down. And one of the practices we have, and this is actually, uh, people use this, I'm I'm sure, in many different worlds of of helping souls get the hurry out of us. Uh, We actually sometimes will play a little game. It'll be 10 minutes of slow motion. 10 minutes of slow motion. You must try it, friends. 10 minutes of moving like this, doing your coffee. Try it. (laughs) Something in you says, this feels so wrong, but it actually resets you, doesn't it? Because there's a quickness to our actions and we don't realize that it's simply a manifestation of the hurry that's in us. And so we slow our pace. We begin to move in God's time, which is slower time, fuller time, lavish, rich, enough time. Sabbath is a deep breath for the system. It's a regulator for the human system and without it, we quickly become slaves. Slaves to work, slaves to play. We make each other slaves in the process. A voltage regulator controls the system so it doesn't get too much or too little. It releases power, it throttles power. Sabbath is a regulator. And without it, we simply lose our way. We lose our way. We'll work too much for the love of money. We'll never call it that, but that's what it is. We'll work too much for the love of money. We'll play too much for the love of leisure. We'll serve too much for the love of affirmation. Pause. We will think too much for the love of progress. We'll use our phones too much for the love of pleasure in the form of a dopamine hit. We just will. And we'll squander one of the most incredible gifts given to humankind, a pause. Can you imagine being those slaves in Egypt who are working every single day of their lives, morning to night, hard physical labor, every single day from the time you are born, you are oriented toward it, and then you are laid in your grave having worked every single day full out. And the word of the Lord comes to you. I'm giving you a 24-hour period to rest, to reorient to my love, to celebrate the gifts and the goodness of life, to take a deep breath, to rest your frame, your limited body, to renew yourself, to sustain yourself at the table of my love, my goodness and my care. 
to enter into worship and allow worship to enter into you as my spirit moves and changes you as only I can, but not to overchurch it. That's just a religious misconception. We overstate things for all sorts of good reasons. But that's part of this process of renewal. And then we celebrate and we move. And by the time we get to the end of a Sunday and we're about to blow out the candle, my wife says, oh, that was such a good vacation. It's like a mini vacation for her every week because we've turned off all the inputs as best as we can. We've turned off the output that is us declaring through our actions, we depend on us. Thanks God for your care, but we've got this. That's what's actually going on inside of us. The way of Sabbath teaches us to rest in God's peace and it starts to become our way of life. So a few thoughts about these three ideas very briefly. The first is rest. Sabbath is given, given to us as a way of rest. I'd encourage you to do a few things on the Sabbath. And these are just ideas. Take what you will. Let go of the rest. But I would encourage you to find one or two that really feel like they could matter for you. Yes, even as a student. Even with all the papers that are due. Rest. Power down your phone. Try powering down your phone for 24 hours. I go to church without my phone. It's at home. Do you feel strange when you do it? Yes. A little anxious maybe? Sure. I've got three kids who live all sorts of places. I've got things to care about. I've got pressures in my work. I've got things to do. It makes me a little nervous. But my wife just puts her hand on mine and says, it'll be okay, honey. It'll be there when we get home. And all of a sudden, I found I've lost my addiction to it. I don't need it. Now I'm in charge of my phone instead of my phone being in charge of me. Take naps. Take walks through beauty. Cease. Put away all commerce. And guys, if you can't do it, God's not knocked off his throne. He's not saying, oh my goodness, you're out. So sorry, you blew it. And he also recognizes times and seasons, especially we who work in church things. We actually see that the Levitical priests, it seems that on Sabbath we're doing some things. But I would encourage you, friends, learn a new way to work. A new way to work that just isn't all intensity, that actually is moving slowly through things and doing things for the love of beauty and the love of joy and the love of caring for others and serving others. You know, you can make a chicken on a Sunday in a way that actually brings you peace. And all the mothers here are going, you have no idea. And I'm like, you're probably right. But you can find ways to do meals communally. I have friends who they gather all their friends at their house and everyone brings something. And that's the way they love to do Sabbath. Most are extroverts. But for we who are introverts, we do a nice little silent meal together and stare in one another's eyes and say, I'm really glad we're here alone. And, you know, it's joy. Or we'll have the kids over. We'll do whatever. But rest. Walk more slowly. Physically slow your system. Slow your system. Don't rush outdoors. I remember one time I was rushing out the door to go lead worship and meet with my band to rehearse. And I had a chocolate smoothie in my hand. And I was moving so quickly right at the doorway as I'm going to be late. If I don't get there, I hit the door accidentally in the wrong way and it spilled all over my outfit, which of course I didn't really care about. <laughs> Just kidding. I really cared. I had dressed, I intentionally that day, and it was all over me, and I stopped, and literally I just laughed. I just laughed. My wife and daughter happened to be there, and they helped me clean it up. I told everyone I'd be late, and you know what? The worship set was fine. It was amazing. God helped. Drive more slowly. Unless you already drive slowly, then speed it up and live a little. Okay, just to the speed limit. Quiet your body, make it still. Number two, renew. Worship with God's people. Journal and reflect on the week past and the week to come. Live a reflective life. Notice the details. It will stop the blur. And you'll begin to actually remember things because you lingered in them and savored them for maybe 30 minutes on your Sunday. And then you'll begin to notice what God might be doing in the week of he ahead because you sat and you lingered in them and you noticed what was coming. Please don't go to church all day, but go to church. Be with God's people. Worship. 
Be in community with others. Share a festival meal. It's a festival in which you open and close with scripture. Maybe give a little extra time to a moment in grace to read a passage that matters. If you need one, try Ephesians, uh, where are we at? Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21. That's a great way to start or finish a meal. How deep and wide and long the love of God for you. Oh, so sweet. Remember and reclaim that you are not made for work. You are made to rest and move in God. You are an abider in this life, not a worker. And finally, revel. I'm going to be honest. As you can see before, I get a little sparkle in my eye because this is my favorite part. Revel. Just as God reveled in his good creation, revel in your favorite parts of creation. Enjoy the taste of good food. Get out the week before and buy foods for Sabbath that are only for Sabbath, that are for that time period. Like, let it be special. If you bold everything on a page, you've bolded nothing, right? I'm just always taking in the things I like the most. Take some time, think about it, pre-purchase it, and have it waiting for you. As an old ketchup commercial said, anticipation, it's waiting for you, which is about ketchup. And uh, some of you know that all food is an excuse to eat ketchup. So anticipate, build those things in, make a beautiful meal, do it in ways that can be as delightful as possible, maybe pre-make it, create family game times or friend game times, play ultimate frisbee, do what you love to do, delight, find joy, because Monday through Saturday or, or whatever your time frames are, you might not get to do that. But if that's a steady part of your life, every week, 52 times a year, you're gonna be a better person at the end of the year. I'm just telling you, less cranky, less mean even if you didn't want to be, less distressed and scattered, you'll just be a more whole person. There'll be fullness moving through life. Enjoy good friends. Enjoy the laughter of good friends. Take hikes, do whatever it takes. Create times where you can, if you're married, just be a husband and wife, just hold hands, be together. Be together, talk about what's happening. Send encouraging texts. I, here's a favorite. I like to make special phone calls to people who I haven't talked to in a while. I touch base with lots of friends and family members on Sunday. And my goal is simple. Encourage them. Make them smile. Make them glad that you called. Thank them for their place in your life. Rest, renewal, revelry. Sabbath will keep you from giving too much or too little in this life. And the way of Sabbath in a 24-hour period is intended to infuse your entire life with rest, renewal, and revelry, revelry in God's good creation. And then you get to set apart time to reorient again, and then you get to move through your week again with those things in your spirit. Sabbath is a gift, and I encourage you not to take it for granted. Let's pray. Spirit of God, we give you thanks for the gift of Sabbath. We give you thanks for the way of Sabbath that you embodied, Jesus. That we see in the stories of your people, Israel, who wrestle with God and wrestle with time and wrestle with all that runs through our hands and hearts. And into this you speak. And you say, be a people of the Sabbath. And whether it's contrary to the culture or not, you stay the course because you will see the fruits and the benefits in the abundant life that I promised. We come with thankful hearts now for the gifts you give. And all God's people together said, Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Dan. I know that. My heart needed that, and I know that we're in a season of the semester that is just full of that hurry, and so I hope and I just pray that that continues to set on your heart tonight or today. Man, you made me so rested. I feel like it's nighttime. I should just go to bed. But thank you so much, and if you're interested in the book that Dr. Hirchin uh, mentioned as well, Jesus in the Wild, I'd be glad. We walked several students through that. It's an amazing book, um, and so if you ever have interest in some of these resources that we throw in front of you guys, let me know. Uh, let Dr. Hirchin know. I'd love to get those in your guys' hands, uh, but I do pray that you get to abide in Christ in the last two weeks instead of just jump through a hoop to finish the semester, and so um, now, and we pray the QR code works, right? You're going to receive credit by scanning this QR code. Hope you have a blessed day. Be sure to scan on the university app.